Bubble, what bubble? The AI spending spree continues for many companies looking to cash in on this technology. Also, we're going to look at the latest data breach for a big financial tech firm and whether all of this technology can help travelers board an airplane correctly. All of this coming up and more on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me on the show today in the guest co-host spot is Lindsay O'Donnell-Welch. She is a cybersecurity journalist who has worked for security news sites like Decipher and ThreatPost. Welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for having me today. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's, just, let's jump right into the, the news this week. Um, first off is uh, we always talk about AI in the show and um, business spending on AI has surged 500% this year to $13.8 billion. This is according to Menlo Ventures. And uh, basically, they went from $2.3 billion spent on AI in 2023 to $13.8 billion this year, according to data released by Men- Menlo Ventures. The report also found that OpenAI has ceded market share in the enterprise AI space, declining from 50% to 34%. And Thropic has doubled its market share from 12% to 24%. The results came from a survey of 600 enterprise IT decision makers from companies with 50 or more employees, according to the report. Now, Menlo is also an investor in Anthropic, so take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, I guess. And OpenAI did not immediately respond to the request for comment. Um, Tim Tully, a partner at Menlo Ventures, told CNBC in an interview that the power shift is in thanks in part to the advancement of Claude 3.5 and because the majority of companies are using three or more large AI models. Although OpenAI and Anthropic dominated the company's AI model use, he said people are, quote, juggling models and that habit is, quote, not a well understood piece of data. Uh, in a quote saying here, developers are pretty savvy. They know how to go back and forth between models fairly quickly. They're choosing the model that fits their use case best, and that's likely Claude 3.5. Now, that, that's you know a little bit of, a again, the grain of salt. So it is interesting to see this, this market shift a little bit. And uh, meanwhile, Meta is just kind of staying at 16%, and Cohere uh, has a 3% share. Google's rose from 7% to 12%, and Mistral lost one percentage point. Um, so th- it's interesting that they've actually broken out the market share on this a bit. Um, and then my opening part about what bubble that, that indicates that there's still all this spending going on. And so that maybe our, our talks about an AI bubble bursting, uh, was a little bit premature, but, uh, what, what are some of the takeaways that you saw from this report, Lindsay? Yeah, it's funny. I've been, you know, tracking AI um, more from the security space, yeah. but still like, what does this mean for companies over the past few years, generative AI and, um, you know, I feel like companies have been in this experimental phase where they've been launching pilot programs, looking at how this could be deployed with specific use cases and applying it to their environments. Um, this report kind of show showcases maybe that, you know, they're starting to kind of accelerate their investments. But, you know, it's kind of clear from my perspective that companies may be investing, but I think they're still trying to really figure out the impact and build up their strategies around it. Um, and I'll give an example, like from the cybersecurity angle, since that's where I spend all my time. Sure. But um, a lot of CISOs have said that they still don't fully understand how generative AI works and its impact on at least the security part of the business. And they're trying to answer questions like, who in the business takes responsibility for AI? Uh, what types of policies should companies create that ad- address potential security and privacy issues that might crop up from using AI? Right. So these are the things that we've really been trying to flesh out over the past years. And the report did talk about a couple of things that, you know, challenges that companies are, are grappling with, like ROI, like data uh, privacy, those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's really interesting looking to your points about kind of the market shifts, like how that fits into the broader profile of what um, companies are doing as they, you know, look at how they can really implement these into the, their environments. Right. It's, it's not a surprise to me having covered a lot of this stuff with other episodes where we've done where uh, companies have come in and said, yeah, we make available all of our technology to all of the different la- large language models. Um, it would be more surprising if, if OpenAI had such a dominant market share and that nobody was looking at these other ones because it feels like businesses are like, no, we're going to try as much as we can and they wouldn't go with just a single platform. So that's not surprising to 
see uh, the market share at least come down a little bit for OpenAI. Um, it is you know interesting that that Anthropic did go up. Um, probably mainly because I'm not really following it too much on the enterprise side. I do follow it on the consumer side, and I don't I don't necessarily see consumers using that. I think maybe that Anthropic is really built more for the enterprise. Uh, it just could be a personal preference because I do have the OpenAI subscription, and that's that's my go to at the moment. Um, but I'm not jumping around as much. Maybe you know maybe I've picked my my horse at this point. No, same, Keith, from a consumer perspective as well. Like I also am just like, I primarily use use one platform, which is Chad GPT. But yeah. I'd imagine, I mean, the report says it too. Like it's it's easy and simple for developers to jump from one to the other. Um, and if you're looking at the use cases, they, you know, there's not kind of one size fits all for these things too. So it, it definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. On, on, on the security side, I was wondering, uh, the, you know, with the CISOs that you talk with, are they, you, you mentioned earlier that they're just talking about, you know, they're just trying to figure out what it can do. It, it feels like the, on the security side that they, they would have two challenges. One would be um, make sure that everybody in the company is not using it to expose it, either data, uh, you know, a data leak or privacy leak or anything like that. So you've got to protect your own assets with anybody using AI for whatever purposes. But then you also have to look into how, you know, not only how are, how are the bad guys maybe using this to get into your system, but then also can you use uh, AI to actually help stop those or prevent those attacks? So that's almost three different areas that they have to focus on. Are, are you, are you seeing that or is it, is it all just defense at this point? No. Yeah. I think there's a lot of focus on that. I would say the biggest most concerning pressing issue is the first one that you mentioned, data governance and right. making sure that when, you know, when when the hype and, you know, applications around these first emerged, I think, especially in highly regulated uh, industries like healthcare, like financial industries, right. there was a lot of concern that, hey, are our employees going to go like accidentally <laughs> put valuable, sensitive customer data into these things? And like, how do we kind of create a perimeter around that to make sure that that doesn't happen and create standards and policies and enforce those. Um, I think that was top of mind. And then, yes, looking at both what this means for the good guys and the bad guys is also something um, that has been talked about a lot, especially over the past year. Right now, what we're seeing for how threat actors are using it is primarily um, pretty simple, like maybe in like phishing emails. Um, but, right. you know, I think there's a lot of anticipation that that could potentially accelerate in the future. Um, and then on the defense side, there are some some cool applications there that they're looking at. So I think that there's a lot of different moving parts and use cases here that, um, that you know, CISOs are, are looking at, but primarily the data governments and data privacy aspect of it is is the biggest thing, I would say. Right. And and the uh, Menlo report also um, it mentions that they were very bullish on AI agents, uh, which is the, the the best new thing or the back, you know, that's the, the new gold thing that everyone's chasing. Um, Google and Microsoft, Amazon, OpenAI and Anthropic are all pursuing this technology and agent AI or AI agents are viewed as a step beyond chatbots, which can perform multi-step complex tasks on a user's behalf, generate their own to-do lists so that users don't have to walk them through the process step by step. So this is an area I think maybe where the security people go, OK, um, you know, because it's a large language model context based that doesn't really affect the attacks other than what you mentioned with like, you know, better phishing emails and, you know, spelling and grammar will be a lot better harder to, to, to detect. Um, but I think with agents, now you're, now you're talking about um, potential automated attacks and automated defense, uh, which, you know, we, we've probably seen some of that so far, but nothing like major, right? Right? Yeah, I mean, that, that stuck out to me because, yeah. you know, one big trend I've seen with generative AI over the past few years is that as a Function, like people still view AI as an augmentation functionality, if that makes sense. And what I mean by that is that they don't want total loss of control. They still right. want a hand on the steering wheel with how AI it, it functions within their workplaces, within their environment. So looking at this tr data and these trends around agents is interesting to me because I wonder how much that behavior and that, that outlook um, of AI might change as we continue to more fully implement and get comfortable with generative AI applications in, in the business 
Um, and, you know, I think security is also kind of wrapped up in that as well, because I do think that people want to be able to be the ones to make decisions there. So, yeah, that's kind of what it stuck out to me when I was looking at these these numbers around agents. Yeah, the thing that we all you agree. Or what. Yeah, the thing that we all have to be careful of is whenever there's a hyped technology like we generative AI, we, it, it's, you know, it was hyped so much and there was some usefulness out of it. But then I think people started to get tired of it or they were like, well, it's not as it's not what was promised to me. And so I'm starting to get the sense the same thing happening with AI agents where people are like, oh, they're going to, you know, it's going to be Jarvis in, in the house and you're going be able to tell the computer to do everything and everything's going to work. Um, and I think, you know, we're not there yet and we haven't seen any of these use cases yet, but I would imagine the security space would be like, oh, all I have to do is push a button and, and, and my, my automated agents will, you know, detect and prevent and everything. And, you know, there's nothing that will happen in terms of any data breaches in the future. I think that's a little bit. Yeah, I'd like <laughs> to think that the uh, security space is a little more jaded, a little more paranoid. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, you never know, though. But we, yeah, yeah, which actually leads us to our next story. This is the big data breach story that came out this week. Um, financial technology firm Finastra is investigating the alleged large scale theft of information from its internal file tra transfer platform, according to a report on Krebs on security. Finastra, which provides software and services to 45 of the world's top 50 banks, notified customers of the security incident after a cyber criminal began selling more than 400 gigabytes of data purportedly st stolen from the company. Uh, the London-based company has offices in 42 countries and reported $1.9 billion in revenues last year. It has more than 7,000 employees and services 8,100 financial institutions around the world. As part of its day-to-day -day business, the company processes huge volumes of digital files that contain instructions for wire and bank transfers on behalf of clients. So uh, the, it goes through this this timeline about basically s the company said they do, they believe that there was no direct impact on customer operations, uh, systems, or its ability to serve customers, and that they implemented an alternative uh, secure file sharing. However, the company indicated that the intruder managed to extract an unspecified volume of customer data. And then he goes back and says, well, there was this uh, hacker that uh, was using the nickname Abyss Zero that was trying to sell the, the data. Um, and then he went back in. And so I think he went back in on November 7th um, and tried to, to get more. And that's when they detected him. Uh, and so but now the, the, this person's account is gone. Um, it's, it's a pretty, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting um, thread uh, on this story. And we'll put that in the show notes. Um, like, what what are your thoughts on this? Was was this something? Because again, you know, you've got data, but a lot of people in the in the the comments were like, "Well, the data might not be anything that's interesting. Like, they might have he might just be trying to sell data that doesn't actually have any any valuable information." What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's definitely something where they're still like investigating about what the actual nature and the scope of the data is. Yeah. Um, I will say, like. File transfer systems are right now like super lucrative for hackers. They're kind of the top target. And that's because they have these massive copious amounts of sensitive files, sensitive data. I know in this one, I think he said it was like processing volume, you know, digital files containing instructions for wire and bake transfers um, yeah. on behalf of their clients. So not sure like what specifically is wrapped up in that, but um, the, the, ability of hackers to have targeted uh, these types of platforms. And if you remember last, I think it was last year, uh, was the Move It file transfer breach. Right. That kind of started this um, realization or like continual understanding by threat actors that, hey, if we target these platforms specifically or these tools, they're just kind of a treasure trove of, you know, sensitive files for from like multiple, multiple companies and customers in this case. And, you know, this specific case was an internal data transfer app and apparently not even the default one. So like this was like scaled back, it looks like. But, you know, when I was reading this, like the, the big thing that stuck out to me was just the uh, file transfer system um, piece of it. Yeah. Then, yeah. Are, are, are there typically, you know, holes in the actual tool? Or is it more about that they got into the the company network and then and then grabbed the files that way? What it looks like, so what they said is that they said at this point it looks like it was a compromised password that was the root cause. So they didn't specify where that specifically was, but um, and this was also an internal files transfer system tool. So it's not like 
you know, this was like something that was high up on the chain and then trickling down. Um, but, you know, of course it was a compromised password that just like seems to be the thing. Uh, and we saw it, we've seen it like behind so many high profile breaches this past year, including the change healthcare breach earlier right. this year that all stemmed back to that. Um, was, so was, was that a compromised password or was that a, uh, a lack of uh, multi-factor authentication on that one? It was, I, yeah, it was a, it that, was a, uh, an account that yes, they, they, uh, were able to get in. It didn't have MFA. So yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, so last <laughs> week, last week, I don't know if you saw last week's show, but we were talking about that report on, um, uh, the bat, the world's worst passwords from 20, I, I, you must've seen that story, you know, crossing the wire last week. Um, I want to ask you, since you cover the security industry, is th- is this something that's only on the consumer side or are you seeing a lot of bad password policies at companies still, even, even after all of these, uh, efforts to, you know, the 17 letter password with 17 symbols, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, I think it's it kind of is proliferates both on the consumer side and the business side, at least, you know, for for some businesses, they now have the ability to kind of enforce MFA and set those policies up. Um, Whereas for consumers, it kind of a lot of the accounts and services give them the option now. So, you know, if you're an unaware, unassuming consumer, you're not really going to take the extra step uh, to set up MFA. But I would say I'm I'm a pessimist having, you know, I'm an optimistic pessimist having covered this industry for a little while, but like I I would just assume uh compromise like assume that your passwords out there. Yeah. There are definitely good steps, but like I would say like make sure that you take the steps after that to set up multi-factor authentication yeah. like by the appropriate steps there just in case the um, the uh, the most yeah. surprising thing from that uh article that came out was that the you know the the number one bad password is one two three four five six um and it's and obviously you can make a lot of jokes about that but i'm surprised that there are still systems out there or websites that would allow a password like that that's what was like who is still allowing a you know a, such a simple password or just a regular word without all of these symbols and 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 methods that you you know they recommend i i think you're right keith and like i feel like the it all comes back to human nature and a lot of people like of course if you're like just an unassuming person a consumer you're going to do 1 2 3 4 5 like if you are i don't know like just a random person who doesn't care and like doesn't think about these things but i think the way that systems and services need to be set up is to assume that that is human nature and like that they need to like set up these protections to make sure that you know those types of behaviors are accounted for and and that people are further protected assuming that they do do that right type of thing. right all right. All right. So we're going to shift to another story uh, from from this week. Um, this is in the streaming media slash cable news area or not cable news, but cable, um, you know, that whole trend of cord cutting. So Comcast announced that it is moving forward with a plan to spin off its NBC Universal cable TV networks, acknowledging that it will be better off without a business that was once its crown jewel. The company, which last month said it was studying the idea, will separate off entertainment and news channels, including MSNBC, CNBC, USA, Oxygen, E, Sci-Fi and the Golf Channel. Those assets generated about $7 billion in revenue in the 12 months ended September 30th. Details of the plan were first reported by the Wall Street Journal uh, last Tuesday. Uh, Bravo, uh, which is known for the reality TV programming such as The Real Housewives, will stay in the mothership, along with the Peacock streaming service in the NBC broadcast network. Comcast is betting that its remaining assets, including in broadcast TV, sports, movies, and theme parks, will be better positioned for growth and that it is the strong balance sheet can absorb the loss of still healthy profits from cable networks. So what's interesting to me on this one is that even the the company that owns a lot of the cable networks is basically cutting the cord as well as they see more and more people that just were like, you know, do you know anybody that, you know, any friends or family members that still have cable on, on, you know, in your, in your circle? do okay. um i would say, I, I know i know a few in, in their defense and actually i i recently cut the cord on cable so i had cable up until about like five months ago wow so, wow it, it, yeah okay and, and then and i also had you know maybe five or six streaming uh services yeah so, yeah, yeah I, so i i sat down and i was like you know what 
Got to put my foot down. <laughs> I, th- I think my mother-in-law is, is still has cable. Like when we go visit her house for the holidays, it's like, oh, wow, a cable box. <laughs> I remember these things. And then, you know. And what it, does that look like again? Yeah. yeah. And it's again, it's like 500 channels and you, there's really nothing to watch. And, and so, it, yeah. yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we cut a long time ago. But so, you know, th- that causes other problems, which actually we're going to talk about in, a, in, an, in, an, in another story. Um but, you know, is there anything else from, from this Comcast Universal thing that, that, that jumped out at you? Or, or was it just the fact that they're basically, like, I don't understand. Does that mean, like, if they're spinning it off, are they selling them? Or are they just going to say, hey, run, run this on your own and, and just try to still be alive at, at that point? I don't know either. I, th- yeah. I feel like, I mean, they didn't they, they announced executive, you know, changes or that there was going to be a leadership uh, pivot yep. around that. So maybe there's a new strategy coming in around them or something, but um, I wasn't sure either, but I do think like we're at a stage where just from the consumer perspective, like we've got like old user behaviors clashing with newer user behaviors and how we uh, consume TV shows and movies. Um, and this is just very representative of that as well. And, you know, it's something where those behaviors are still emerging and, you know, it's, it's something to track for sure. Right. And then obviously the only other cable, the places where you might see cable news or cable, cable channels would be at like the airport or, you know, at a, you know, at a hotel in the afternoon, (laughs) they just have nothing else to show. So they, (laughs) they put it on the cable channel. Uh, Okay. So we'll, we're going to monitor that, but, but that, that leads into, so I've got two other streaming stories I wanted to talk about. Um, Did you watch the, the uh, Mike Tyson fight the past couple, like a weekend ago or? I tried. Did you? Okay. So you actually, so, (laughs) so I, I decided not to watch it. Only because I think I knew what was going to happen. And then, you know, I, and then I'm monitoring my social feeds and it was like, yeah, it's, it was the whole buffering problem. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so most you, people you predicted balanced. this. Well, not that yeah. I predicted it. It was just, well, yeah, I mean, well, I think it was supposed to start at eight. And then, you know, I don't think that the actual fight started until 11, 10 or 11 on the East I, Coast. It's. Yeah, it's, it's, it is funny. I was look at, so I was trying to watch it and, um, you know, my husband was like, you know, like I have two young kids and I like to go to bed at like, you know, 10. My right. husband was just like, you know, this isn't going to go on to like 11. And then of course, Netflix tapped out on me. So, right, right. Um, so, so because of all of the issues that they had, and this was a pretty big debacle for them, I think, because I don't even know if anybody that I know actually saw it other than, you know, the, the, um, uh, the buffering part. And then there was the part where they were interviewing Mike Tyson and he showed his rear end. I don't know if you saw it. And that, that became like a big meme thing too. Um, yeah. yeah, that was, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, I flew to Twitter, of course, I, you know, when I saw the buffering issues and or, like, or, or X those, as we like, have to call it down, you know, that or X. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it was just one of those like strangely heartwarming, like times when everyone unites and is like, <laughs> screw you, Netflix. Like, Yes, I want to watch this. I stayed up late. <laughs> so. The entire world can unite ar- around the issue of of hating a streamer for not being able to to, yes. um, to provide you know concurrent streams. I think they said that they had sixty five million concurrent streams going, um, which is actually very impressive. Um, except for yeah, when you have you know eighty million people that want to watch it, so that means you, you know you're not going to get um, fifteen million or whatever. I think that the final numbers came out and it's something about a hundred. They had a hundred million views at some point, but then sixty-five million was the concurrent streams. Um, I'm wondering, like, are are we so spoiled now in this world of internet connectivity that that if we don't get perfection for some of these things, that we just instantly turn to hate and and, and anger on the internet? Is that what is that the world we live in now, Lindsay? I think it is. Yeah. And I'll tell you, this is a little, a little anecdote here, but like my, I have like a, a three-year-old who watches, uh, he watches a lot of things on YouTube. Um, so like Miss Rachel, if you're a parent, you know, so, or like a parent of a young kid, you know, um, and the way that YouTube works, obviously you have like the ads that come up and then you can just click through them. Um, right. And he is so used to having instant gratification of watching this show that like if an ad comes up, he'll be like, mom. And then like, I have to click through. So I'm just like, okay. So like, this is just how it's set up to be right now. And like, 
for the younger generation too, they're going to grow up with this kind of easy access really to, to technology. Well, and to yeah. TV. I mean, the, you know, the interesting part is like, so my, my three kids are all teenagers and they barely watch TV anymore. Anyway, they're all on their phones and they're, they're watching everything through either their, their phone or their tablet. Um, Cause I, I'll get random messages every now and then from my daughter. She's like, what's the password for Netflix? What is it for, for Peacock? All this other stuff. I'm like, all right. So I know that she's not what, cause she doesn't have a TV. She's at college. So I, I know that she's watching it on her her iPad or you know or they're sharing with friends or whatever uh, so but when they were growing up they had the same thing like you know we had it was the the days of the DVR and you know skipping ads was was really easy if you're recording a program you could skip the ads really simply and so as things have shifted back I now watch a lot of free TV like I I'm, I'm obsessed with Pluto TV um, so if I don't have a specific show that I want to watch, I'll just put it on Pluto. And the, the problem with that, and even with Disney plus now, cause we've got the ad, the ad supported Disney plus is that they don't have enough commercials that are, uh, you know, unique and different. So if you're watching one or two shows, you see the same three or four ads. And that's the annoying problem now is like, you know, I don't want to see the same ad over and over and over again. But then my kids are yeah. the same the same way. It's like, you can't skip this ad. Or like, no, you can't. You can't. You, you know, I go and this is what it was. And then I become old man again. And I was like, well, this is what I was like when I was a kid. Like, you know, I, you I've already. That we had to, yeah. Yeah. Do you know, we, we would have to sit there for half an hour to only get 21 minutes of content. Um, and then yeah. and then, you know, we talk about cliffhangers for for season episodes and all that thing is like, yeah. And then we'd have to wait a week for the next episode to, to show up or, um, yeah. you know, the whole summer, you know, we, we were wondering like who shot JR and that's really old reference, but you know, things like that, like that's, yeah. I don't think, you know, it goes right over their heads and, um, we're going to get, no, and we're yeah. going to be back in this world. So even, all right, all right. So, I want to get back on track a little bit because all of this Netflix stuff, um, Christmas Day is coming up and Netflix is broadcasting two NFL games uh, and they just announced that they've got Beyonce for the halftime show for one of these, mm -hmm. for one of the games. And so everyone is like, oh man, we just saw you mess up this, this uh, Mike Tyson uh, fight. Like we're, you know, we're really worried about the NFL. And, you know, and they're like, well, not as many people will probably be watching those games as as they did the fight because the fight was a one time event. If you're a fan of the of the NFL, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think that they're, they're predicting yeah. fewer people. So that won't be as big of a problem. However, yeah. last last, you know, last year they did the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of streaming issues on on whoever was running it. I just. You know, it's it's weird that that broadcasters can do really good on over the air broadcast, but they still haven't. It, it still feels like they haven't tackled the streaming thing correct. So, are, are you They're worried still about working through the games? Yeah, yeah. Are you yeah. worried about about you know Christmas Day NFL Netflix? I, I thought it was um, so. I, so you said Beyonce is doing the yeah. halftime. <laughs> so I that might that actually I wasn't worried. So now I am. <laughs> and I will say I was actually reading a, a Wall Street Journal op-ed the other day that was like Netflix. Netflix better brace itself uh, during the Christmas NFL games because you know if you've got like Steelers Nation like three eggnogs deep and buffering, <laughs> have you ever buffering? <laughs> It's not going to be as friendly as it was at the fights. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that wasn't really friendly either. I mean, to, you know, right? Um, yeah, it, it's it. We had talked on this show, uh, geez, last year when when there was the idea of of streaming just one of the playoff games, and mm -hmm. for that, the, the issue for that was not necessarily the the quality of the streams, but more about the exclusivity of that game and you know people were getting kind of annoyed because it's like well now i've got to subscribe to all these different services in order to see live sports and it feels like live sports is going there at some point the super bowl is probably going to be live streamed right or it's going to have to, you're going to have to subscribe to something to see it which like that blows the model right way out of the water when it, you know it used to be all about Hey, you know, you could get this for free and then you'd have to sit through the ads and then the ads became popular. And so you, you had people watching the games just for the ads. I think that the, the Beyonce stream will, will probably be more popular than the actual game. I think that the game might, you know, you, you would have a problem if everyone tunes in just to watch the Beyonce halftime show. That's my that's yeah, my gut yeah, feeling. 
All right. That's probably going to get the, the, you know, non football people to watch too. So I, you know, I think it will be a fair amount of people yeah. watching. Yeah. All right. Good luck, Netflix. All right. So now one last story in the streaming space. Um, this was a, a cool story in the Wall Street Journal as well. Um, and this is something we've talked about the show. This has happened to me. There's a new streaming customer out there, and, it, and it's called the Subscription Pauser. When streaming video customers want a break from their subscriptions, they are increasingly saying goodbye for now, but not forever. As subscription prices rises and streaming-centric home entertainment becomes the norm, families are establishing their own hierarchies of always-on services versus those that come and go with seasons of hit shows or reports. New data from subscription analytics provider Antenna offers a deeper look into the subscription-pausing habits that customers are developing as services like Netflix, Disney+, Plus, and Apple TV+, Plus become the go-to way of watching TV in many households instead of cable. Uh, the monthly median percentage of premium streaming video subscribers who rejoined the same service that they had canceled within the prior year was 34.2% in the first nine months of 2024, which is up from 29.8% in 2022. The habit of pausing and resuming service means that the industry-wide rate of consumer defections, which has risen over the past year, is less pronounced than it appears. The average rate of U.S. customer cancellations among premium streaming services uh, reached 5.2% in August, but after refactoring and resubscribers, the rate of defections was lower at 3.5%. So... I, I'm totally in this camp for, uh, you know, when when a lot of these premium services started raising their prices, that gets my ire up. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, I'll show them. I'm going to, you know, unsubscribe. Uh, and so I then, you know, it becomes a job where you're like, OK, are we watching this anymore? I, I, I pulled my whole family. This was a bad idea, Lindsay. Don't ever pull your family about making a decision about this stuff. Um, I had this chart. I was like, give me your top three services that like you know or or rate them like one meaning you know can't live without um or you know and then five was like all right it's okay to get rid of it and so out of so i have three kids and, and then my wife and so out of the five votes that we all had like everyone had their their own favorite um nobody we could not agree on which one to get rid of um i couldn't get rid of amazon because of the shopping um linked there for you know prime video or prime you know, the, the free, yeah. sh the, the free shipping, um, you know, one kid want, you know, couldn't live without Peacock. One kid couldn't live without HBO max. And so I'm now in that stage where I think I ha almost have all of the services and then they started bundling and then, you know, so it's are, just like cable all over again. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like all of the money I was trying to save by cutting the cable. It's, it's now all back in, in, in this world. Do you have that issue or, or I mean, you know, you, you know, with, with, with smaller children, you probably have different services versus what I have. Yeah, it's well, that's actually a really interesting point of that, too, is like people in different demographics are going to, you know, right now I'm on Disney Plus because, you know, if you're a parent, you're going to need Bluey. And then, but then <laughs> as soon as I, I age out of that, you know, right. I'm, I'm cutting that as soon as fast as I can. <laughs> so, and, you know, I think it is a trend for sure. Like, I think uh, this is like the new trend, like the old trend was like people sharing accounts and then Netflix and some others kind of look to crack down on that. And this is kind of the new one of people jumping and, um, across different subscription services. I think, you know, people still do share accounts, but like still. Right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think the other, the other issue is, uh, what was it? I had another point and I forgot what it was. Um, oh, a lot of, a lot of these other services that we get access to are done because I'm buying other things like my cell phone plan gives me Netflix as part of the plan because it's a it's a T-Mobile thing and so I don't actually have to I don't see a monthly Netflix bill it's just bundled in until this deal goes away at some point or it might not ever it might yeah. just be like yeah you're you're gonna get Netflix forever um that's it's that's a really good point. And yeah. I think the thing is, is that there's no loyalty amongst consumers or, or TV watchers like uh, for these services, right? Like if, if there's like a TV show or some sort of bundle deal with, with another piece of tech that I have, like that's, what's going to drive my decision-making. Like as soon as like the office went on Peacock, I was like, okay, I got to get Peacock now. <laughs> like, right, like things right. like that, like people are going to go where the movies or the TV shows are. And like, I, I have no loyalty to Netflix or to like, you know, Hulu or something. It's, it's all about the content that they're offering. And unfortunately 
you know, because of how the licensing works for these things, like they're constantly adding and dropping all these. And that's why people are going and skipping from one to the other so quickly. Right, right. For me, it was it was um, the, the announcement that Peacock was going to host the community movie um, that, you know, and, and so I went back mm-hmm. on to Peacock. But then, and, you know, but then my son, who is a huge WWE fan, was like, well, now I can watch all of these events now. And then they watch Sunday Night Football. Now, I don't do the, the regular Sunday football games. So that's the one service I don't have is I don't have the CBS slash Paramount Plus. Um, so at least I, I, I'm not on board with 100 percent of all those different streaming services. Um, so you may change your tune in like a month, though. Who knows what what sort of thing? Well, well if the Patriots would actually get changing. better, I might change my mind. Oh, and then I I was actually so my son is also a huge Celtics fan, and so I've been toying with the idea of the NBA League Pass because we don't have cable. You know, he wants to watch all the Celtics games, and the only way we can watch Celtics games at the moment is when they're on TNT because that has a partnership with Max. Um, so I, but I don't have ESPN plus and I, you know, and we don't have the, the local cable version, but the NBA yeah. league pass, I think I can get, you know, some of the, more of the games, but then there are some games that get blacked out too, man. This is almost like a full-time job trying to keep track of all this stuff. It literally is. And, you know, I, I had the idea like a year ago to be like, what if there was like an app that just helped you pick and choose which streaming service to use that mo- any given month, like given the TV shows that are on it or whatever. And then I was like, OK, literally, this is cable. Like, this is the same thing. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like, where are we and what's well, going to yeah, the idea, go? you know, the idea of back in the day when you had a cable plan, you would always say to them, well, why can't I just pick and choose the channels that I want? You could pick bundles and you could, you could pay, but they would never allow you to just say, look, I I have no interest in the golf channel. I'm never going to watch anything on the golf channel. Take that out. I am interested in A, B, and C. And you could never do that. And then the streamers came out and said, well, you don't even need any of that. Now you can, you can sort of pick and choose streaming services, but then with license, you know, that's where Netflix was, was awesome because they had every, they had almost everything, you know, in the early days. Um, And then they started creating their own shows and that's when everyone, you know, watched all of those original programming. I I still think it's a mess and it's weird that I have to now manage all of this, whether it's, you know, I have a spreadsheet that says this is when your subscription ends or when, when it, when it renews. And so I can make that decision to cancel at that point. Um, That is commitment. I, yeah, it is a full-time job. You're right. You've made like spreadsheets. You've got like a slideshow for your family. And you, like, <laughs> oh, I, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask them the next time I do it. I'm just going to start canceling. And then I'll, I'll get a text message from one of them going, hey, how come I can't access anymore? And I'll be like, well, go get a job and you can pay for it on your own. Um, and that'll probably exactly. end up being at some point. You know, I can't wait till I tell my kids to get their own Netflix account. That should <laughs> That's, that's truly when when they'll grow up and become adults, you know, when you get off the family plan. Yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't been able to pull the trigger on that yet, but, you know, it's coming yeah. soon, I'm sure. All right, one final story I wanted to get your opinion on, Lindsay. So American Airlines um, has a new technology that they're planning to uh, roll out, which is cracking down on travelers trying to get on the airplane before their boarding group is called. I didn't realize this was such a big problem, but apparently it is. So customers who try to scan a boarding pass before their group is called will hear a two note sound and be turned away. According to the airline, American airlines has nine boarding groups. Oh my God. Ranging from first class customers and top tier frequent flyers to travelers who purchase basic economy fares or the least expensive tickets. Airlines reward their high paying elite frequent flyers with perks such as earlier boarding and have been trying to keep this exclusive. The new technology as of Wednesdays in more than 100 non hub airports, around the U.S. following tests over the past month at Albuquerque International Sunport, Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, and Tucson International Airport, according to American Airlines. And I guess they're going to roll this out to some of their hub markets. But so first question, is this a big problem? You know what? At first I was like, I'm all for this. But then when I think about it, I think the people that have gone up, they're not they're not malicious, right? They're, they're usually making a mistake and I don't think they deserve to be shamed. Like, (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's so naive. I'm thinking that they're all malicious. You're right. You know what? (laughs) I'm too nice about it, but (laughs) all all I could picture when I heard about, when I heard this story was uh, like, I don't know if you watch game of Thrones, but like, you know, the like shame part, like (laughs) Like, that should, instead of just a two, what, like what's the, you know, two notes, what's it going to be? Is it going to be like, or or is an air horn? You know, you know, if they really want, they should just, they should just do the shame, shame thing. They should be like, shame, shame. Yeah. (laughs) 
Um, the, the bigger the bigger thing for me is that like the people like you know before their gates are called like going right up to the line and like it, that that is like there, there oh, needs oh, to be uh, like a bigger thing against you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, where they where they, where they yeah. basically crowd around the entrance so that when your boarding group is called, then they can be the first in the line for boarding group seven or or whatever yeah, number that yeah. they have. Yeah, and I, I mean, think they. The, yeah, that article did say, you know, there's a couple other uh, airlines that are, I guess they send alerts now to try to like shift the crowds away. Um, but, you know, that doesn't, it just, <laughs> people are just going to be, you know, the way that they are on flights. <laughs> so. it, you know, and, and again, you know, I understand the reason why people want to get on before everybody else. Because it's it's all about the overhead bin space, right? It's all about if you're... Right. I mean, I, I just started when, when, you know, the last, I haven't traveled in a while, but the last time I did travel, it was always, I, I don't care. I bring a backpack and I throw it under the, the seat. I'm a short guy, so I don't have the legroom issues that a lot of other people do. And that's why they bring on carry on. And I, I usually check my luggage for whatever the one bag free, or I'll even pay the $25 for the, for the bag fee. Um, I yeah. just put most of my stuff in the, in the, in the regular baggage. Um, so I don't have the same kind yeah. of desire, you know, you know. But yeah, the, this, this whole running up and, and trying to get in early, it, it's annoying. Like, do you remember Southwest Airlines when they would have those different boarding zones? They got rid of those. I don't know if you saw that news from, from you or know, did they? about six months ago. Pretty well. Yeah, I think yeah. they're going to assign seating now at some point. But but that was the same thing, too. You'd get, you know, you would have to, I have, I have a friend of mine who used to do a podcast with me and, and he would, we would talk about this all the time where he was flying on Southwest and you would have 24 hours to you could you could do this 24 hours before your flight call the number or log in and check in and then you would get that a boarding you know that was like the golden ticket from Willy Wonka if you had the a boarding group because then that, that guaranteed that yeah. you were going to get either a window or an aisle um, probably aisle I, aisle seats are more popular than windows I, I love the window seats but um, anyway That's yeah, no, I will say I I didn't fly for a while either. Um, but then this past year, I think I flew three red eyes um, within a two month span. And so I saw it all. And, you know, I do think like, it's just, yeah, flying continues to bring out the worst in people. So uh, yeah. Yeah. This doesn't feel like this should be the biggest problem that American Airlines is facing. I, it, you, you know, but, true, but, true. you know, shaming people into, you know, it would, it would work that once, I guess. But I mean, I've, I've had people that have jumped ahead of me and, and usually the, the person checking in was like, well, no, that's the wrong boarding group. So I don't understand why an automatic tone is going to shame you more than just, you know, having the, the gate check in person <laughs> tell you. To go no, to the back of the line. Yeah, yeah. no, not yet. They got to take the attention off the uh, more pressing issues like limited space and like. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, all, and bag fees and all this other stuff. So, all right, well, we'll, yeah. we'll be monitoring that, see if anybody else does does that kind of thing. But I do like the idea of, of, of having something more than just a, a you know, two tones. I, 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 and if they yeah. start using that shame, shame thing, you know, we're going to give you we credit. Should, we should push the shame, shame thing. I think they would like it. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, Lindsay, again, thanks again for joining us on the show. And so we're not going to see you next week because we have uh, no shows for the week of Thanksgiving, but we'll, be, we'll come back with you on uh, in December. So again, thanks for joining the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any thoughts you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.